Hi, this is Lisa and Todd from the Neural Alignment Model, and today we're going to be talking about a post that we had put in the group a while ago. Todd had put a post up about what is your deepest fear, and he we had noticed a pattern that was coming out, right, Todd? It was about, you know, the loss of a child, and um, people saying that that was like their greatest fear, to lose a child, to um, lose a another child if they'd already lost a child. And so we got talking about what that actual um, fear was and, and why it started. And so we're going to do a four-part series on today. We're going to talk about like the biological, the um, anthropological reasons why we would have this fear and, um, and then how it impacts our life. And then tomorrow we're going to talk about the emotional and get, and get deeper into this process and then we're going to talk about how to rewire your brain out of it um, for, for the next uh, other two videos. So it's going to be a four-part series. So, Todd, the loss of a child. Uh, biologically speaking, why do we have this fear? Well, the first thing you have to understand is that from the perspective of our model, everything we believe is really driven by survival. Mm -hmm. Things that enhance our ability to survival and things that we adopt over time, over millennia, over thousands of years, maybe even millions of years as humans and pre-humans, that not only enhance our, uh, our probability of survival, that also then get biochemically reinforced for doing something that enhances survival. And emotionally, in a sense, also supported for that in a way where, and I think this is an important nuance, where we start to create our own narratives, our own stories, our own archetypes, our own identities, mm -hmm. um, culturally, individually, through families, um, historically, that become the explanation or the justification or the reasons why we feel these powerful survival feelings. But more importantly, in, in my mind, than any of the archetypes of the stories is really just the basic operating hardware. It's, it's just the way that we work. And so <clears throat> when you go back to hunter-gatherer times, let's say 12 to 15,000 years and before, then what actually ends up happening is you think about the death of a child. There's a few different things that will trigger the most intense survival response. So it's interesting as we started doing some research about a lower status something became very evident. It's like, why did lower status create such an intense survival response? And why does it today? Why does the marketing machinery try and create a, a sense of lower status that you don't have this and you're not good enough to compel us to, or motivate our behavior to go buy something that's gonna make us feel like our status is raised. Mm -hmm. And this, this actually operates more in men than it does in women biologically. It was a bigger survival threat for men than it was for women. And so this sort of alluded to um, what we're going to talk about related to children and why we feel so compelled to protect our children. But the lower status meant that <clears throat> I actually might, in a band where there's this incredible commitment, this fierce commitment for egalitarianism, that in spite of that commitment, that if I still have perceived lower status, then if there is a time where there's a shortness of resources or for whatever reason, um, there's a much higher likelihood that number one, I'll get kicked out of the band. Well, if I get kicked out of the band, um, you know, we didn't have sharp fangs and big claws and we weren't super fast runners and we're kind of wimpy. I mean, other than we got this big brain. And so we're kind of wimpy. And, and so getting kicked out of the, the, the band was almost assured death. Maybe you get lucky and somehow some other band might pick you up and probably not. <laughs> they, they might not know why you have lower status. Maybe you're an asshole and, and uh, you know, you just don't get along with people. But so in all likelihood, you would die in, in a matter of time. And so <clears throat> also, if you had lower status, there was another form of kind of like death. In a sense, you wouldn't find a suitable mate. And if you don't find a suitable mate, that is akin to death. It's almost the same in death in a way as it pertains to your genetic material, your DNA getting passed down from generation to generation. 
and, and unconsciously and biologically, men are compelled in a sense, and I don't say this to, to upset anybody, but at least let's just say historically, um, men have been compelled to have as a sex with as many potential partners as possible because our DNA wants to get passed down to the next generation. Women, women are sort of compelled in a bit of a different way. They want the DNA passed down to the next generation too, so they seem to be more compelled to make sure that that child that they've had makes it to the age of reproduction. Mm -hmm. They become the, 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 uh, the providers and they create this secure environment and they do everything they can to see that it's likely that their children, their offspring will make it to the age of 15, 16, whatever that would be, and then they can have their own kids and now it's mm -hmm. passed down to another generation and so on and so forth. Yeah. So we have different operating systems in a sense. And, and so now when we relate that back to what's happening today, these deepest fears that people have been expressing in the group, this overwhelming, well, we, we can kind of explain that away. It kind of makes sense. Like we have a, a cultural narrative and, and a social understanding that of course you would feel this most overwhelming fear because we love our kids more than anything. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the explanation for why we have these intense feelings, but the intense feelings are really in a sense more about our own survival or at least equally about our own survival than they, would, than they are with our kids. But it's not our, the survival of our body exclusively, it's the survival of our genetic DNA. It's the survival of our genome, our, mm -hmm. our information, that part of us that makes us special, that part that wants to create a legacy passing down from generation to generation. Does that make sense? It does. And we had talked about a little bit earlier um, about um, women and men and how, you know, if, if there was a loss of a parent. So I think that ties in. The loss of a child also ties into the fear of you dying, leaving your child alone. And, and I think those fears are very interwoven if you actually ask people about it. You know, as a mom, I know that you go, well, what would, what would I do? What would happen to my kid if, if I wasn't there? And then you also go, well, what would happen to me if, if I lost a child or lost another child? In some cases, people have already lost children. So um, talk about the, you know, explain to me what, uh, tell the people what you explained to me about um, the rates of survival if a parent was gone. Yeah, and this is fascinating. And again, it's just, it, it really just is pure biology. It, and it's very, very hard to argue. And so you may not like um, what this alludes to or what it speaks to, but the, the, the biology actually reinforces what we see anthropologically. Mm -hmm. And so if you were a hunter-gatherer, and <clears throat> let's say, for example, you're a hunter-gatherer child, and your father... Um, stops providing for you, stops caring for you, um, or, or is killed, or somehow abandons you uh, for one reason or another. Well, we know, anthropologically speaking, that on the average, and every band is a little bit different, but that on the average, it seems that the child then becomes approximately four times more likely to die. So that makes sense. That's yeah. logical. You know, the father might be the protector. He's going out. He's bringing back food. And so the father dies, even though you have the band, even though there's other men that would be bringing food home, even though there's other men that would still be protecting you, believe it or not, because mm -hmm. it did take a village. And back then, when we were evolving, the whole village would support your survival. Mm -hmm. But of course, your father's more committed to your survival. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stories that we could talk about that sort of speak to that, the way that they used to interact, the celebrations that they used to have to try and encourage or engage the entire village of becoming more and more protective. Sometimes <clears throat> the couples would pair bond in a way that would make it almost impossible for the father to know whether the child was his or not. Mm -hmm. And so from one child to the next being born, every father had um, some investment in that child surviving because there was a possibility that several of those children might be mine. Right. And so, so that sort of ambiguity a paternal ambiguity was a positive thing. Yep. So, so. Well, and it, you can even take it further into, um, like, even today and back into the Middle Ages and into, like, Industrial Revolution. 
if a, and even today in, in countries such as India or Africa, if a father dies and a mother is left with the children, it's a lot harder to survive in a yeah. lot of cases. Yeah. And we can actually even measure hunter-gatherer bands today. I mean, there are several hunter-gatherer bands still yeah. around. And there's a lot of good anthropological research that's been done over the last 100 and 200 years. They've taken yeah. really good studies. So we don't have to pretend that we have to go back, you know, 10,000 years and archaeologically uh, make assumptions about right. what we're uncovering. No, we have, we have evidence that's still there today. Hunter-gatherer bands today are very, very similar to the hunter-gatherer hunter bands of old. But what's fascinating, and what a lot of men don't like to hear, and also some women don't like to hear, mm -hmm. is that even though that's a huge number, that if a father was killed or stopped providing care for his family, that the child was four times more likely to die. And between the ages of zero and six, I mean, that really ups the ante a little bit, makes things difficult for the child because there was a high rate of death already mm -hmm. um, for children under the age of six or seven. Um, but here's the, here's the big news. And I think on some level, this is also logical, mm -hmm. but that if a mother was killed or unable to or stopped providing care for her offspring, that child was not four times more likely to die. That child was 12 to 20 times mm -hmm. more likely to die. Yep. And, and for small children, that just really speaks to the importance of mothers versus fathers. Mm -hmm. And fathers might not want to hear that. And I'm not saying that this is not, in a sense, a generalization. And that if a mother died and a father came in and tried to provide the same type of care that a mother would, that maybe he would be able to match that level of nurturance and protection and whatever that a mother could do. That we don't know um, for yeah. sure. My assumption is that we couldn't completely. Uh, the operating hardware just isn't set up that way, but that maybe we could get close. Mm -hmm. Well, and you see that where men, like in the 1700s, 1800s, because I did a lot of research on my own family line, a mother would die and there would be a new wife almost instantaneously. Mm -hmm. They needed that other, you know, cooking, cleaning, looking after the children. And a lot of times it was someone who her husband had died and his wife had died and they brought big families together. Well, and the, the interesting thing, and I say funny, but it's not funny. In a sense, this, is, this also can give some women a, a bit of relief mm -hmm. because in working with families, it's remarkable how many times I hear Todd, it just seems so unfair. You know, the husband, you know, he abandoned his kids when they were nine years old. He took off. He, he, um, he wasn't really providing care. He had a drinking problem. He was a yeller. He was a screamer. Whatever it is that your father was horrible at. And there seems to be this real ability that children have and willingness, in fact, to kind of forgive their fathers. Like mm -hmm. he comes back after four years of being off in some foreign country and, and uh, reliving his youth or something. And he comes back and the kids are daddy, you know, arms wide open. And the mothers are looking at this and like, wait a second, I yelled at you once and you're still angry at me and blaming me for every bad thing that's happening in your life. You know, yeah. like I have been there for you, sacrificed, given this, given that. Well, you know, a part of that, is again culturally reinforced mm -hmm. but the bigger part of that if we believe that everything that we do behaviorally comes from this survival response and and now to 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 know biologically that mothers up to the age of six or seven are just so much more important for survival well what does that mean that means the child's going to pay more attention um be more emotionally impacted mm -hmm. and ha have a stronger need for that healthy attachment and connection with that mother. And if any way, if she seems even aloof, a little disconnected, not really engaged enough, I mean, all of those are in fact a trauma. That's a survival threat to the child. Mm -hmm. We don't, we can't quite figure out in a modern culture why these kids are so angry at me, why they're still screaming at me, why they're blaming me for this. And it's just biological. Mm -hmm. So, 
Yeah. Moms can take a breath in a bit and go, wait a second, that's unfair. And yes. it, it kind of seems unfair, but it is what it is, right? It's just biology. Yeah. Well, and we got talking about this yesterday because I had um, said, you know, uh, a lot of moms feel like they're not the fun parent. They're not the parent who, you know, does the wrestling or plays Hot Wheels cars or goes swimming and stuff like that. And a lot of moms really beat themselves up for it, even though they're, you know, looking after the home and they're, you know, maybe doing homeschooling or making sure kids get to school and they're, you know, teaching their kids about all sorts of things around the house and how to cook and how to do things. And, and we have this feeling that we have to be everything. And yet, like you said, you know, dad comes home and it's like, yay, dad's home. And even if he's been gone for years, um, explain to the people why a dad's role in mm -hmm. uh, tends to be quite a bit different than a mom's and why children, uh, once they get about six years old and older, kind mm -hmm. of take towards the dad in a way. What skills and stuff is the dad providing that we can tie back anthropologically. So once a child in a hunter-gatherer life or a hunter-gatherer band made it to the age of six or seven, their probability of survival went up dramatically. Mm -hmm. Whatever the skills that they learned, whatever the strength of the speed with which they could walk, their autonomy, their independence, um, provided this opportunity now that, okay, I'm six, I'm seven years old, and now my chances of survival are much, much higher. Mm -hmm. And, and so, of course, there's this over-attachment. Um, it's not an over-attachment, but what would, again, there's just an emphasis on the importance of mother yeah. and being around the women. And the things that I would learn were really important for survival. It's not that dad wouldn't come and play with me. And the funny thing is, is that dads are always sort of seen as more playful. They're naturally the players, but we're just teaching kids different survival skills in different ways. Mm -hmm. The dads traditionally were typically the hunters. The mothers typically and traditionally were the providers and the gatherers. And so moms would learn about a root and a flower and a, and a vine and an herb in a way that could be compelling and interesting. And, and the children would be intrigued by that at some point, you know, two years of age, three years of age. And in a sense, that was almost like the mother's type of play is teaching how to cook and and moms still feel comfort in that. They, they seem to enjoy it. And I talk to a lot of mothers who feel not only guilty, Lisa, but hate, really dislike playing. They don't somehow get a payoff for it. Yes. It's not fun for them. Play yeah. in, in the sense or in the way that typically we would see men or children do it is, is almost torturous for a lot of women, maybe even for a majority. And I don't want to say that, and it certainly yeah. doesn't apply to everybody, but, but it can be, even if it's not torturous, at the very least, it feels like work. Yes. You know, I'm going through this motion of playing, and isn't it supposed to be laughter and ha ha ha? Yes. And no, it's just like, I'm, I'm forcing myself to laugh, and I'm, I'm yeah. thinking about, couldn't I do something more productive here? Yes. And, you know, it's hard to, for a woman to lose themselves in the play. Yeah. Especially the type of play that men inherently and naturally adopted, which is sort of roughhousing. Like you mm -hmm. see almost, most mammals do some version of that yeah. roughhousing. Well, well, it's a little bit more of a boy thing. Girls yeah. already start to veer off a little bit mm -hmm. at a certain ages where that becomes less interesting to them. Well, and, and again, these are all survival strategies. The way that we play is teaching us different things that are critical for our survival. In fact, hunter-gatherers didn't sit around with the intention of teaching. Mm -hmm. um, they didn't say, okay, sit down, it's time to learn ab about herbs and plants, or this is how we... They just included the kids, or the kids included themselves. Yep. Kids have inherent curiosity, and they would come up and go, oh, what's that herb, and why are you mixing them those ways, and mm -hmm. wow, isn't that an interesting color? And so the kids would be engaged out of curiosity, mm -hmm. never really sat down with the intention of teaching. You must learn yeah. this. It was all a part of a process of enhancing survival where we unconsciously just sort of played these roles. Mm -hmm. And so today, it still seems that in general, yeah. dads, you know, you talk to a dad about providing care for a baby in the first six months. And they're like, but the guy can't even sit up. You know, what am I going to do with him? Yeah. You know, he doesn't interact with me in any way. He can't walk. I mean, it's kind of just a, he's a bowl of jello. 
Yeah. You know, and of course, a woman loves those first six months. Yes. She's like, oh, that's when I have my baby in my arms nonstop. And he's just, uh, you know, he's just, or she, or he is just there for my, you know, loving and my sharing. And I can just stare into his baby goo goo eyes and see how cute he is. Yeah. So, you know, in general, we have to accept that we're biologically different. And these differences were really important because the combination of those two, two differences continued to enhance our survivability. Well, and like when you said that to me, because I feel that, you know, I don't really love to go swimming in super cold water. I don't enjoy playing Hot Wheels for three hours with my girls. Um, you know, I don't enjoy the going out and playing soccer or baseball or things like that. Even though I like the sports, I don't enjoy doing it. And so when you said that to me, I was like, oh, that makes sense. You know, hand-eye coordination, learning running, learning passing skills, learning how to swim properly because we live on, you know, the West Coast and we're in the ocean all the time. And, um, you know, things like the Hot Wheels, learning how to plan a track out, learning to hedge your bets, you know, what is the best course of action? What is the best car to use? Those were all, if you look back anthropologically, those were survival skills. I mean, which is the best arrow? Which is the best stone? Which is the best route to take through the forest? You know, can you swim out to get certain things? And, and when you tie it back in, it makes, lots, it makes a lot of sense. And I felt like, oh, finally, yes, I walk through a field and I go, hey, that's a dandelion route. And you can eat this and grind this and do this with it. And this will heal cuts. And, oh, and I'm and bored to tears. <laughs> exactly. And the kids are like, oh, that's cool. And then dad's like, hey, let's go chase a butterfly. And poof, off they go. And I'm going, you know, and, but it totally makes sense now for me. There's roles and it's okay to have those roles. And then we had talked about like, if a dad disappears, who fills in those roles? And usually a mom will fill in part of them, but mm -hmm. it makes sense. Like if dad all of a sudden shows up after four years the kids go, yay, that's the skill set that I'm missing. The mom's not perfect yeah. enough. And biologically, they're, they're drawn to that, that energy to learn those skills. So it starts to make way more sense. Yeah, and they, and they crave it. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is built into the operating system. You yeah. know, all of these skills are, are really, and maybe they're not as essential today. They aren't because yeah. we have societies that take care of us that those people yeah. that don't have all these survival skills yeah. are still provided for <laughs> but but that doesn't change the operating system and maybe for the first time you know it does kind of look like people's physiology starting to change i mean i certainly have no science to support this and i could be wrong but but it seems like there might be more homosexuality there might be more transgender sort of circumstances where where girls actually feel more like boys and vice versa i don't know if why that's happening and i could be wrong it might just be a safer place to come out so i don't have any numbers to support that but what's also interesting about the male and female differences and if i can just use that that to categorize us for now because i know now there's many more complexities in terms of how we identify male and female but it's also explains the differences why men might have a, a more tendency or, or strengths around becoming obsessed and focusing on career or obsessing on sex or a woman, you know, um, be, because we had so much practice while we were hunting to focus on one thing, mm -hmm. just catching my prey. That's yeah. it. Everything else is just a, sort of assisting me or getting in the way of this one objective. Yeah. And, and so we could see that as a, in a modern world in some ways that shows up and gives men an advantage, but then women also have an advantage. Women's brains clearly work better at multitasking. Mm -hmm. It drives me crazy. I wish yeah. I could multitask. Yeah. I wish that I could sit around at one of my parties and do what all my female friends and my wife have the ability to do. Listen to four conversations at once and actually respond. Say, Excuse me for a second. I know we're talking, but I just have to respond. I heard something over here. Yeah, I don't really think so. And I'm like, well, <laughs> stop the noise. Can we all just talk about the same topic? Yeah. 
it's just remarkable, but the brains are just different. Well, and then they're serving food and filling people's drinks and making sure the kids are sorted out and the dogs are in and out and everything. Yeah. Like my husband yesterday, because I was uh, doing some sewing and stuff, he was looking after making dinner and I asked him to do four things. And in the end, he got one of them done and he, he got it, you know, the food got on the table, but all the other stuff. <laughs> right. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. And okay. I, I have an admission. I'm sewing. And I'm dealing with the kids and the dogs and I'm, you know, looking at computer stuff and responding to social media. <laughs> You're not going to believe this. I, I'm admittedly saying I'm embarrassed to admit this, but yesterday I drove my wife to the airport. She's on a business trip down in Las Vegas. Yeah. And of course we took our dog to go say goodbye at the airport to his mommy. Yeah. And I was so thinking about my next business call when I got home, it was like eight in the morning, so it's still cool outside. Nobody sent me hate mail. I left the dog in the car for an hour. Oh. <laughs> before I'm like, where's baby boy? Where the fuck is baby boy? Okay, that was a lie. Actually, my daughter came home and went, dad, where's baby boy? <laughs> and yes. then I realized, I left him in the car. Oh yes. my, thank goodness it wasn't hot. I can't believe yeah. the men at times can be so oblivious. Yes. And, and it drives, like I know it used to drive me absolutely crazy with my husband. Like, how can you not remember to give the dog the pill? And how can you not remember to feed the kids a snack? And well, I'm working on my project. And I'm like, so, but it makes sense once you understand the hunter gatherer aspect. Yes, it still annoys you, but you yes. know, when they focused, you know, it, it made sense. And it made a lot of sense to me when you said the certain roles, because yeah, I don't like roughhousing and I don't like wrestling and I don't like, and there are some women who do. And, you know, sometimes in a lot of the same sex marriages, you'll have one parent who may do a little more of that. Yeah. You have two ladies who have kids together. You That's have right. one parent who, who gravitates to that a little bit, but mm -hmm. not totally. But then maybe there's an uncle or maybe there's a friend. That's right. They rough house. That's right. The kids or a lot of people, you know, like the boys and girls clubs or, you know, where they get together with, um, uh, you know, um, you know, a, a, a younger male who, who, you know, goes out and plays or goes and plays soccer, or goes and does stuff. There's still, right. for me, I grew up without a dad at all. He wasn't around. Uh, you know, I had a little bit of male influence and my uncle would take me out, you know, um, into the forest and we'd do stuff. And, and uh, my mom had a boyfriend who taught me how to drive and knock down trees in the forest and stuff. But I got it through joining army cadets. There you go. Where I got my rough housing and survival skills. And so you do, sometimes find it but yeah. when i thought about it i was like that's where i got mine from that was mm -hmm. an influence for me yeah yeah it's amazing right i mean you could make assumptions and conjecture about a variety of different social ills that we would assume <laughs> might be coming from one and or the other parent not being there yeah and and so yeah, when you talk about same-sex marriages, again, there's not hard data on this, at least that I'm aware of. But what seems to matter is that there's this real blend of feminine and masculine energy. Yes. And so, and so look, you could have two same-sex partners that both have feminine and masculine energy. Yes. Or one adopts a feminine role or a masculine role. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's not going to be perfect, right? I mean, one of the beauties, I guess... You know, here we have this tolerant society now, which is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Seemingly to me, if we're really telling the truth, more peaceful and tolerant than ever before. And it's a global phenomena, thank, mm -hmm. thanks to the internet. But, you know, there are some other things that we're still adapting to. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these different types of dynamics and relationships, there's always some sort of a subtle – maybe there's advantages that I don't see yet, but there's some disadvantages for sure – and yet, you know, collectively, we're still doing a good job. We still have, you know, the community. We still have yeah. the government. We still have these safeguards in place. I mean, yeah. obviously, we wish we could do better. But it does seem best if there's a blending of a yeah. strong masculine presence and a strong feminine presence. And I don't care yeah. what sex you are. 
Yeah, exactly. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter because within each of us, we have both of these energies anyway. Like my personality is more masculine. I mm. really have that forward masculine energy. Um, and when I focus, yeah, I block everything out. Like when I'm watching TV, my husband can go to the grocery store. He can go do so. And I don't see anything if I'm watching a movie. It's just total focus. Yeah. So, you know, those, but then I also drop into the other feminine energies when I'm looking after the kids and stuff. And so tying this all back into the loss of a child, we didn't get off topic. We're just trying to explain how we are genetic. Uh, you know, genetically and anthropologically, um, you know, genealogically predisposed to certain fears and why they happen and why they show up and why our brains think the way they do because brains form addiction. That's where addiction forms for us. And so look at how far back these traits go and how deep this fear is. It starts to make a, a lot of sense. And so what we're going to get into next in the next episode is, is this fear of loss of a child really the underlying fear or is it a band-aid fear? And there's actually a deeper fear underneath that. So mm -hmm. I'll be back in the episode tomorrow and we're going to talk about that one. Great. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs>